Welcome to How to Talk to Kids About Anything with Dr. Robin Silverman, a podcast loaded with practical tips, powerful scripts, personal stories, and simple steps to make even the toughest conversations easier. So get ready to get the information you need to make the impact you want from someone you trust, your friend, parenting expert, Dr. Robin Silverman. Hello and welcome to How to Talk to Kids About Anything, where we give you the tips, scripts, stories, and steps to make even the toughest conversations easier. I'm so thrilled to be your host, Dr. Robin Silverman, child and teen development specialist, author, and speaker, and most importantly, parent of two great kids who give me the opportunity to love, learn, and grow every single day, whether I want to or not. Believe me, I get it. It's not always easy. But we're in this together, and thankfully, we have a lot of wonderful people we can call on to help us along the way. Now, this show is all about how to talk to kids, and it's about connecting through conversation. So today, we're going to strip it down to understanding communication. Being able to have productive conversations is a skill, and it's a skill built on a series of other skills, from being assertive to listening to ensuring that we're being heard correctly, and yes, that we have heard and understood correctly what others are saying. These days, with so much communication relying on electronic screens and emojis, the art of conversation may be at risk, and that's a scary thought. To put ourselves in the right frame of mind of taking in the importance of good conversation skills Just think of what happens when poor communication happens. People get the wrong idea, mistakes are made, feelings are hurt, stuff doesn't get done in the right way. And when conversation is clear and strong and good, progress is made. We feel understood, we feel connected, and truly, it can make all the difference. Now, I've been excited about this guest for weeks, probably months, because when you have a show called How to Talk to Kids About Anything, it's pretty thrilling to have somebody on who talks about how to talk. Celeste Headley is the host of On Second Thought at Georgia Public Broadcasting in Atlanta and has been a host and correspondent for NPR and PRI since 2006. She's the author of an upcoming book, which I'm really excited about, called We Need to Talk, How to Have Conversations That Matter. And it comes out September 19th. It's a practical guide to the lost art of conversation. Celeste TEDx Talk, sharing 10 ways to have a better conversation, was listed as one of the most watched TED Talks in 2016 and named the number one must-watch TED Talk by Glassdoor, which over 11 million total views have been calculated to date. I've seen it multiple times, love it. I've watched it and gotten some really great ideas and I encourage you to do it as well. But let's turn our attention to this wonderful guest because we've got great questions to ask and I'm sure even better answers that we'll hear. So thank you, Celeste, for joining us on how to talk to kids about anything. It's really my pleasure. This is my first conversation about talking to kids, so this will be be great. Yeah, it's really exciting to sort of turn everything on its head a little bit, and instead of just talking about conversation in general, we're talking about conversation specifically with kids. But before we get into the meat of the matter, for those who haven't had the opportunity and pleasure to meet you and see your TED Talk or hear you on the radio and, of course, read your book, would you just take a moment to tell us what gets you up in the morning And what got you so interested in the art of great conversation? Well, you know, I've been a journalist now for about 19 years or so. And so I have conversations every day as part of my work. And I have conversations with literally every kind of person that you can imagine from all countries, all demographics, all races, all professions. And what I began to notice first off was that I needed some help. I was a professional at it. I'd had a huge amount of training in it. And yet something was missing for me in terms of consistently having a really great connection with someone in which I was able to both talk and listen. And that's really the balance as I began to look um, further into conversation, especially all around me in my work life and my home life, that balance between talking and listening, it became really clear that it was off. It wasn't 50% one and 50% the other. It was just too much talking. 
<laughs> I'm sure. And I know that that's a big problem that we're having today. And and plus, so much conversation happens through screens, as we talked, you know, I mentioned before in the intro. And we have adults and kids on iPads and phones and laptops. So how are we supposed to teach kids to hold a good conversation in a time when faces are often glued to the screen and connection isn't really happening as much face to face. So you're not going to have a good conversation if they're looking at their phone. Mm. I mean, that's just the bottom line. Right. The, the phone has, has to go away. And I don't mean just um, set it down uh, because some of the best research that we have shows that even the phone's presence it, it, the fact that it's visible is very distracting to the mind. You may think you're focusing on another person, but in fact, part of your mind is occupied at worrying about that phone and wondering whether you're getting an email and wondering whether it's going to make noise. Mm. So the best thing to do is put it away during the time that you're talking to that person. Um, you know, and I realize I have a kid. I realize they're going to complain about that. But we also have really great research showing that even kids acknowledge that their phones are making them unhappy mm. um, in some cases and are interfering with their relationships and that they acknowledge that they're addicted. So, you know, I think the reason why my talk has over 11 million views is because there is a growing awareness of how much that phone is getting in the way of human conversation. What about the people who argue that having a, an electronic connection with somebody, being able to pick up the phone uh, or being on a computer screen allows them to say things that they've never said before or allows them to say things they would never say in real life? How do you communicate about that? What What's your answer about that? So first of all, um, that's usually a bad thing. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. <laughs> We actually have some also good research into our behavior when we're on email or instant message as opposed to in person. We are way ruder. Mm -hmm. We're less likely to negotiate. We're less likely to cooperate when we're writing an email than when we're face to face or even on the phone. So frankly, possibly there's a reason why you wouldn't say that to someone's face. <laughs> um, I, I guess there are there are instances in which maybe it makes you braver, you know, mm -hmm. thinking of the love letter, exactly. right? Exactly. Um, <laughs> and and you know, fair enough. But if that's what you want to write, write, then actually write a love letter. If you need to type it, type it and print it out. Because email is a terrible way to to communicate. Mm -hmm. it, it's not great from the sender's perspective in terms of getting your message across, and it's it's definitely not very effective in in terms of the receiver and, and whether they're getting your message or not. So if you really want that love letter to be cherished and read email or instant message or God forbid text message with emojis is a terrible <laughs> way to do. That. I have to agree with you. And, and perhaps we need to be braver by being able to print it out or actually say it to the person's face, whatever it is that's on our mind. So what would you say, because you have been studying this and writing about this, what would you say are some key tips to having successful conversations? So the first one is to be present. And this takes on a little different tinge when you're talking to kids, especially. Now, when I say be present, a lot of people think I mean, you know, to stop doing their work or stop trying to multitask. And I do mean that. But I also mean be present mentally. <laughs> be mindful. Mm. So if you are mentally or emotionally distracted, it's not a good time to have that conversation. Now, between adults, what I usually suggest is walk away. Explain to the other adult that uh, you're distracted, that you can't give them your full attention, and that you need to put a pin in it and come back. With kids, that's not going to work, is it? <laughs> yeah, not all the time for sure. Absolutely. Yeah, when they yeah, when they need your attention, they need your attention. Right. Uh, as you say, not all the time, but often. Right. So in those cases, as a parent, that's just a time when you're just going to have to pull it together. And, you know, I can't say enough about mindfulness meditation. It's one of the only ways we know to train the brain right. to focus that way. Um, but one way or another, if you're talking to a child, you have to learn how to bring your full attention there so that you can fully listen. 
Right. I think that's really important as well. And, uh, you know, we as parents, especially, and we're also, you know, my audience is teachers, and parents, and mentors and coaches. There's so much going on. I mean, there's we're we yeah. we're multitasking even when we're not multitasking, right? We might be doing one thing, but our brain can be in twelve different locations. So uh, it's it's a challenge for people to stay fully present. But kids really know when you're not really there. They know it. Oh yeah, and they will Adults irritate you to no They're end. Just, uh, adults do too. They're just generally less likely to point it out. Right, but. But kids notice they do, right, and they, they do. need your attention more than anything else. I'm, I'm sure that you have read all the time that it's not really about, um, it's not really about what you're doing with your kid, just that you're there, right. <laughs> right? And and when they say that you need to be there with your kids, they mean really there, really right. listening to them. And this is a, this becomes a problem with parents and kids because. Um, Parents, p- kids so rarely know what they're talking about, right? And and especially when they're teenagers, they say stupid stuff. Mm-hmm. They, they make assumptions. They say stuff you know is wrong. And and we as parents tend to tune that out. We stop listening to it because it's, it, you know, it's misguided. Um, but I would encourage you to just go ahead and listen anyway, uh, especially if your point is to try to guide them to the right path. You're not going to be able to do that by dismissing their opinion or not really listening to them. And also you may miss some important mm-hmm. stuff. You may make assumptions about what they're going to say and you could be wrong. Right. So yeah, you got to really listen. Right. And it's important to be able to connect with them. And sometimes, you know, little kids, yes, they may be talking off the wall, but those stories and feeling like somebody is noticing them when so often little, especially little kids can be dismissed. It can be an important moment to connect and say, really, what, what else are you thinking? (laughs) Exactly. So so what else besides really being present would be a helpful tip for successful conversations with kids? So the thing I would say is, um, don't forget how powerful questions are. I, I, I mean, look, I have a 18, oh, just turned 19 year old son. Mm-hmm. Um, so we haven't quite gotten out of the three word answer to everything. <laughs> I say. But the, I'm seeing the light at the end of the tunnel. But that here's your best tool, especially with a teenager, but this is also with younger kids as well. Your best tool to get them to talk to you is a a well-designed question. Right. And by well-designed, I mean a, a simple direct question, starting with who, what, where, when, why, or how. Um, and that you do that because by asking a simple question, you're letting them add, add the complications. You're letting them describe it and use their own words rather than describing it for them and checking to see if they agree. Yes. Yeah. Yes, that's so important because I think that as parents and teachers, we often do that where we, we're basically saying a statement, but in the form of a question and then just asking them to say yes or no. Exactly. Exactly. You want to ask them a real question. What happened today? What did that feel like? What were you thinking at the time? Not what were you thinking? Because that's a rhetorical question. I mean, real (laughs) questions. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> or you were thinking this, weren't you? And, right. and that's you know, feeding them the, the answer. And it's and then they're either on the spot or they're, they're pressured into saying yes or no. And often it can be much more nuanced than that. Isn't that true? That's absolutely, that's absolutely correct. And again, your kids will surprise you. I mean, any parent knows that kids are surprising. Yes. They, they, they are unexpected. And that's part of look, that's part of the heartache, (laughs) Mm -hmm. but that's, that's also part of the joy. Um, but they can't surprise you if you're constantly, uh, making assumptions and speaking for them. Um, so you have to let them talk and, and be silly and, and make mistakes if they are going to, um, the Socratic method, as long as you don't use it to, to bludgeon someone, it's not like peppering them with questions. Um, the Socratic method can be a really great way to get your kid talking. I use it, frankly, I use it all the time with my kid because he's smart and I'll ask him philosophical questions or ethical questions. Right. And I'll say, you know, I'm just curious. If you were in this situation that's happening right now in the real world, what would you do? 
Um, it's, it's how I get him kind of involved in politics. It's how I get involved in involved in environmental issues, et cetera, et cetera, because I ask him stuff that he has to think about. Um, yeah. and he gets really engaged. I love all of that. And, and I think even adults love those kinds of questions so that they can explore things in their minds because, you know, a lot of our life is about being, you know, shuffled this way and shuffled that way and routine and schedules that being able to stop and think about those philosophical questions can be fun for everyone. So uh, I can imagine, I, even on my Facebook page, we, I ask a question every day and it, more and more people are, 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 are chiming in. I mean, they could be on anything. Like yesterday, I think it was, you know, what scares you? Or um, I've done, you know, if you could change your profession to anything for one day, what would you do? I think people just like to explore those and kids do too. And I don't think we often think about it beside, you know, beyond what do you want to be when you grow up? So I, I think what you're saying has a lot of weight. Yeah. And I think, um, also it's just, it's just a way to, to wake their minds up. Mm -hmm. You know, they're holding generally tools in their hands or they're sitting behind a computer all day that puts their mind to sleep because it, it does all the imagining for them. Um, oh, so point. it's, it, it's good to, to get to the place where um, you can wake up their mind and, and maybe get them to argue with you a little, really civilly and politely, more as a debate, not an argument. But you know what I'm saying? Yes. That's about. Yes. Um, and, and see how that's going. And, you know, another really important thing when you're talking to kids, especially because we tend to do this too much, is not to repeat yourself. And, and the reason I say this is because... Um, oftentimes moms, especially, mm -hmm. uh, but everybody, when we don't get an, an acknowledgement that we just said something, or we don't get an answer of, oh yes, okay, I heard that I'll take care of it. We tend to keep coming back to it and just rephrasing it. Right. <laughs> so right. I mean, I feel like there's a bunch of arrows pointing at my head right now. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So, I agree you know, take out the trash and then we come back 20 minutes later. You know, the trash needs to go out before 9 p.m., blah, 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 blah. You know, it's 8.30, you haven't gotten the trash out, you need to get it done by blah, blah, blah. We keep rephrasing it. But here's the problem with that. Um, neurologically, we're training them not to listen to us ever mm. because they know we'll repeat ourselves. Yeah, I, I have a, a good friend uh, who also was interviewed on, on this podcast, Dr. Dara Harris, and one of the things she talks about is, especially with kids, she's a, a child psychiatrist, is doing a multisensory uh, delivery of whatever information you need to kids. So instead of speaking, you know, off the second floor or from the balcony or wherever you yeah, are in your exactly. house from down the hill, you can, you speak directly, you know, okay, so eyes to eyes, you know, you might touch them on the shoulder, exactly. you know, your touch is really powerful. It is. And so that way their focus is on you too, because as she talks about, a lot of kids can have many radio stations going on at once in their head and they may not have tuned into what you're saying at all. They're not actually ignoring you necessarily, but they're thinking about something else or their mind is elsewhere. Right. And they don't, they haven't been trained to learn to force themselves to focus because again, you are going to say it again mm -hmm. multiple times. So there's no need for them to learn to focus. If you tell them something once and there are consequences when they didn't listen, they very quickly, and look, I know this personally, mm -hmm. <laughs> it is a, it is a painful and sometimes cruel process, but you can do it. You can train yourself to say things only once and you can train your kid to listen when you talk because when you tell them something important and you only tell them once and they miss it and then there's consequences they learn really quickly so how have you done that or what do you suggest in order to train our child to listen the first time Okay, so your friend is absolutely right that you need to A, set them up for success, mm -hmm. right? You need to make sure that they're not in the middle of a video game, that they're not angry with you at that moment for interrupting them, in which case, and if you do have to interrupt them and they're ticked off, which is often going to happen, yes. just say, listen, I'm going to give you five minutes, I'm going to come back in five minutes because I need to tell you something and it's important that you hear me. Um, but just make sure you're in the same room, you're looking them in the eye and you're talking to them and you don't, uh, speak excessively. Mm -hmm. You know, there's, there's 
there's timelines of our attention span on the internet. We only have an attention span of like eight seconds, which is one second less than a goldfish. Oh gosh. Um, in conversation, we have maybe 30 to 60 seconds of somebody's attention. And another highlight of that is that they, a human brain can only hold one or two things in their brain at one time. So first of all, if it's important, keep it short and to say one thing at a time. Not a list. No laundry <laughs> lists. Okay. No. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Okay. So, so we have some really good skills so far so that you're asking our powerful questions, that we are making sure that we're giving them an opportunity for success and, and just speaking short and sweet and directly. Uh, we are being mindful and paying attention to one thing. So what are some of the biggest mistakes that people make in conversation? I, uh, the number one biggest mistake is that we don't listen. And I, I don't want to harp on this, but the thing is, is that most people believe they are good listeners. That That's every time they poll people, most people believe they're good listeners and other people are not. Mm. Um, but here's the dirty secret we're not naturally good listeners. And when I say we, I mean human beings. Anyone who's had an infant knows that we are not born knowing how to listen. You have to learn how to listen. And it can be tiring and it can be tough because it literally burns energy when you listen in an engaged way. So that's the first thing mistake that people make is not actually listening. You know, the, the average amount of time that between one person ending a sentence and another per person starting the response is less than half a second, which means we're not actually listening to everything they say before we start thinking about what we want to say in response. And, and Stephen Covey said it like he said, um, we, we don't, most people don't listen with, uh, with the, I'm, I'm paraphrasing with mm -hmm. the intent to understand they listen with the intent to reply. Right. Right. Such and a good so quote. that would be the number one thing is actually listen to everything they say, take a breath while you think of how to respond and then respond. It's going to slow everything down. And that's a, that's a good thing. Um, that's a good thing. Yeah, go ahead. No, I was I was just going to say that I know that with listening that we have different levels of listening. I mean, there's you know yeah. that you're listening to people's words. Then there's the level where you're listening to people's emotions and sort of the energy behind the words. And then there's the idea of using your own intuition that you sort of know something's going on, but um, you might not know exactly what. So can you talk a little bit more about what it is that we really need to be doing in order to be a good listener. So, you know, there's, we forget with all the digital communication that we do, we forget that there's really three parts of meaning in communication. One third is the words we use and their actual definition, right? The vocabulary. One third is body language and one third is tone of voice. Mm. So the first thing I would say is that already if you're talking over the phone instead of in person, you're losing a third of the meaning. But even then, human beings are biologically, we are evolutionarily, we are cosmically designed to take meaning from someone's body language and their voice. Mm. We are brilliant at hearing the, the really subtle changes in somebody's voice and their breath. And, and that's the best way to communicate. So the first thing is do not communicate anything but absolutely basic information exchanges through text. Yes. Or email. yes. <laughs> at least, at the very least, pick up the phone. Mm -hmm. um, but the other thing is, you know, don't, don't make it a thing. Um, and, and the reason I say that is don't stress out about it. If you set up this, if you set up a situation where you in person and looking at somebody and, and you are entering a conversation with honest curiosity and, and no other ulterior <laughs> motives, mm -hmm. <laughs> then your body and your brain are already designed, um, to do really well at communications. Human humans do communication better than any other species on the planet. You do this well. You're great at this. <laughs> mm -hmm. Just relax, put the put the phones away because they don't do communication as well, and really listen and and have patience with the person who's who's speaking to you. Don't see that conversation as a as a 
a task that you need to put a checkbox in and move on from. I know in your te- in your TED talk you talked about how if you're really listening, you don't have to be conscious of nodding and you exactly. know, making sure you're looking at the person because yeah, you're it's, listening. It's true. All that terrible advice we got um, to look somebody in the eye and and nod your head and say, "Uh uh-huh, and blah, 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 blah. (laughs) It's just teaching you how to pretend you're paying attention. And that's totally unnecessary if you're paying attention. (laughs) So like I I said, don't turn this into an acting exercise. Um, just, Just really listen to somebody. It's such a good point. I just, it, it, I haven't uh, listened to your TED talk in in a month or two, but I, I still remember that you said that because it struck <laughs> me as uh, absolutely this is what we teach. Absolutely, this is what we think. And in fact, when my seven year old boy is looking away when I'm trying to have a conversation with him. I'm still asking him to look at me because we don't feel like somebody is listening to us as well if they're looking away. And yet perhaps they are. Absolutely. Um, but it's just our own, our own feeling that they may. Yeah. Not and it's okay at that point to say, Hey, are you, are, are, am I losing you? Mm-hmm. Um, you know what? I'm, I need, I just need to tell you one thing that's important or whatever it may be. So if this is a bad time, can I, do you need 10 minutes? Do you need 15 minutes? And that's also okay for little kids. That sounds like an adult conversation, but frankly, I used to do that with my son all the time and it gave him agency. Mm. It, it empowered him, um, to say, I, I'm not going to force this on you if that's not where you are. It allowed him to say, to think about what his mood was and what was going on in his mind, um, and gave him a little bit of control over that. And I think that's, that's quite important. I do too. I think kids need some control in their lives. They're often told what to do and when to do it, where to do it, and how to do it. So when we can give them some options and they are able to speak for themselves, that can go a long way in building connection and trust. Absolutely. So I am also going to guess that one of the biggest mistakes that parents and teachers may make with kids is that we lecture. Is that accurate? Yes. And <laughs> it's and you know what? It's understandable because we are in the role of teaching, right. right? We're taking someone who doesn't know a lot of things and we're trying to teach them as best we can. And that's a that's an act of love. Um I, I said this to, you know, what? I literally had this conversation with my son earlier today. Hmm. I said, hey, what time do you go to work? He said, four. I said, when is the last time you checked? He said, last weekend. I said, you know, you might want to check again because schedules change. And he checked and it had changed. And I said, listen, um, I'm only telling you this because I had to learn the hard way. You, you got to check. You, it constantly mm-hmm. you can't just assume and this is the thing about lecturing is that it's not a conversation anymore when you're lecturing uh, you have to flip that lecture on its head even when you have to teach somebody um the best thing to do is actually go into that conversation to learn instead of to educate and there's 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 some plenty of empathetic reasons to do that but there's some really good scientific ones and and let me just tell you one which is that Telling somebody something never teaches them. <laughs> That's just, people don't learn that way and certainly not kids. And and if you've ever told your kid, you know, don't, don't leave the house without your wallet ever, you know, for sure that they don't go, oh, okay, I'm from now on, I'm never going to make sure. No, they only learn that lesson when it actually happens. Um, so when they leave and they needed it, like when my son was getting ready to go on a plane flight and had not brought his wallet. Ooh, that's a tough <laughs> lesson to learn in that circumstance right there. Absolutely. So if if we know that our brains just don't, even adult brains, frankly, look at how much confirmation their bi- bias there is in, in the news. We don't, we don't really learn and change our minds because someone has given us the facts. Not even adults do that. Mm-hmm. So go into your conversation with a kid knowing that you can't really tell them what to do and how to do it and and make that an easy transaction. A better way to do that is is to create a conversation in which they're coming up with solutions for themselves. So beautiful. It's so important. Again, it provides the agency, 
but it also provides ownership, right? We're, exactly. we're they're owning it and they're thinking, what would I want to do in that circumstance? Or how can I remember my wallet or everything else before I walk out the door? What reminders do I need? Not what is my mother saying or my father or my teacher? Exactly. And so I, when I was away and, and, you know, I said to my son, I was like, look, you're not good. You, you have trained your body not to wake up when the alarm rings. Ooh. How might that be a problem for you? <laughs> <laughs> and he said, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> and I said, okay, look, you have a job. And if you don't make it on time, you're going to get fired. So you tell me how you solve this. Your body is not waking up when your alarm goes off. You have to be at work by a certain time. How is this going to work? And he eventually, through a lot of pulling and tugging, <laughs> came up with his own solution. And when that didn't work, he, we tried something else. But again, if I had just said, okay, do this, do this, number one, it may not work for him because what worked for me may not work for him. And that is tough for us as parents to accept. Right. Um, but number two, there's just no way he's going to, he's going to just do what I say and, and, and learn from that. Wouldn't it it's be just, great if he did though? Wouldn't yeah, that be it, awesome? <laughs> I think of how advanced the human race would be if we didn't have to redo all of the mistakes the generation before us it's made. So true. I interviewed Jessica Leahy who wrote The Gift of oh, Failure. Yeah. yeah, she's so she's awesome. Great. And you know, we talked about this and she's like, you know, my son, he left this his homework assignment on the table. It took me everything not to bring it in for him, but he learned how to make a checklist and put it on the refrigerator and make sure that he had everything before he walked out the door. It didn't happen again. And I think that's what you're saying here. You know, when they have the experience and then they can create the system, that's when we've got permanence of change. That's exactly the case. And frankly, this isn't just about kids either. Yes. This happens between adults also. We always seem to think that what worked for us is going to work for other people. So when someone has a parent that dies, we tell them about the time that our parent yes. dies and what we did to cope with it. Yes. And there's just no, if the chances that what worked for you to get over that grief are going to work for another human being are really slim, mm -hmm. really slim. They're a completely different person in a different place at life dealing with very different things. So if they ask you for advice, you can give it. But I think the same is true for either adults or children. No unsolicited advice. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, I, I think if they ask for you and you say, this is what worked for me, what do you think would work for you? Right. Then it's puts it in their court again. Exactly. You know, this idea of, of death that you just brought up, it just stirs something in my head. You know, there's a lot of everyday conversations that we have with our kids. What's for dinner? Schedules of the day? Who's going where? What about your job? All those things. But we've had some opportunities to talk on this show about really serious topics from to, for how to talk to, about, to, to kids about sex, to death, to suicide, misogyny, bullying. What tips do you have for setting the stage for more serious and important conversations of that nature? So I have a kind of a special insight in this only because my father died when I was about nine months old. Mm -hmm. um, and so I had so many conversations with adults who didn't know how to talk to me yes. about my father. And my uncle took his life when he found out he had terminal cancer when I was in think third grade. So I, I've had a, a lot of experience with death at a very young age and a lot of experience with adults that kept mucking up the conversation. Mm -hmm. um, so here's what I would say. And again, this is t as true with children as it is with adults. And that is um, be honest. Um, don't say stuff you don't mean. And don't make assumptions about someone else's feelings. Probably one of the worst things anybody could ever say is, I know how you feel. And it happens all the time. All the time. Mm -hmm. All the time. But you don't. You don't know how they feel. That, that's mm -hmm. just the truth. And you don't know what they're going through. I mean, second to I know how you feel is, I know what you're going through. Mm. You don't. No. You don't. Mm -hmm. Let them tell you. At those moments in people's lives... They want to be heard. And if they have nothing to say, that's okay. Have the strength inside yourself to be silent and, and be present without speaking. 
one of the great tips that you can give, right? I mean, yeah. maybe that there's no words that need to be exchanged in that particular conversation that you just need to be present in there. Um, yeah. So that's, that's very important. Um, and is there, I mean, I, as I said, there's a lot of, of tough conversations that people can have with kids really more. And, you know, we feel like we need to be in lecture mode, but we're not and we don't need to be. But on these things on how to talk to kids about sex or drugs or death or all these things, but they even if they haven't gone through it, like more maybe that you want to, them to, to know what's going on, especially how to talk to kids about sex or something like that. So is there anything that we can do to kind of bridge the gap or make sure that we're going into a conversation that we know is going to be more serious. So even if our kids ask us, they say, you know, what is this? What is sex? Or what is, I heard somebody say something about suicide. Is there anything we should be doing in those more serious conversations when our child hasn't actually been going through anything in particular, but they're asking questions for knowledge? So, um, yes. And ev obviously every bit of information that I've, that I've said is changeable because every kid is different, right. but <laughs> here's what I know to be true for most kids. Um, if they're actually bringing something up to you, it means it's urgent, mm -hmm. right? I mean, most of the time they're not going to talk to you about stuff that they think is awkward or, um, upsetting or serious. I mean, it's a joke in our household that all that, that I, I so often try to bring up these subjects before it becomes any kind yes. of crisis. Yes. Um, I see a, a story in the news and I'll be like, Grant, you know, we need to sit down. I want to talk to you about this story in the news because it's got me upset <laughs> and I want to hear what your thoughts are, blah, 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 blah. So I try to, to bring this stuff up before it they ever have to talk to me. A part of that is because I want him to know Right. There, there's no such thing as, as out of bounds. Um, but I also want him to know that I'm not going to be shocked by whatever his thoughts are, right. you know? Um, and when you're talking about someone else other than them, the stakes are low for them to be honest. They, there's not, they don't think there's a possibility for getting in trouble if they're just talking about a hypothetical or something that's happened to someone else. Right. So that's the first thing. And if they do bring it up, you just can't, BS them. Children have a BS meter. You know, I mean, don't make up different words. Just say, look, I don't want to, there's some of this stuff I feel weird using the correct terminology because I'm your mom. So I'm going to say honker. Okay. <laughs> right? I mean, just tell them the truth. I feel awkward. This feels weird. I'm going to use a different word. Um, or if they're talking about suicide, and this act literally happened to me with my son and, and one of the kids in his um, elementary school, actually, took his own life. Mm. Um, and I sat down and I said, look, that I, you know, that's really tough. How well did you know this kid? I have no idea what this is like for you. I never went through it. Can you explain what's going on in your head? How do you feel? What are you thinking? How much do you know? What can I tell you about the situation that might be helpful for you right now? What have you heard from other kids? Are how, how are you, I mean, it was just a whole series of questions to try to gauge where he was. And I, I just basically invited him to ask me things. And yeah, I think it's important. You were asking a lot of temperature questions as uh, Dina Alexander, we inter in interviewed on uh, how to talk to kids about sex. And it was a lot of those kinds of temperature questions, like where right. are you standing in, in this? And I think that your scripting was really brilliant there because it, it, it allows them to talk, allows you to get the information you need, and it lets you know what needs to be said. Yeah, exactly. You know, it's funny to go to something a lot with that's way less serious. Are, wait, are there children that listen to this? Can I talk about Santa Claus? <laughs> you can talk about anything you want. No, there's no children <laughs> listening. And if there are, please get them out of the room right now. <laughs> <laughs> so when it was time to tell my son that there was no Santa Claus, which I knew because other kids were beginning to hint at it in school, um, you know, I just sat him down and said, listen, 
uh, I want to tell you about the the joy that parents get out of Christmas. I said, because you got, you know, let me explain to you from my point of view for just one moment. You know, Christmas for me, it's a lot of work. And I go through all the things that I have to get done and blah, 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 blah. I said, but I'll tell you what, I, 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 get, I have a lot of fun buying gifts for you. But the other thing that parents get to do is we get to be Santa Claus. That's what we get to be. We get to be this magical person who brings happiness into somebody's life and we get to do it anonymously so that person doesn't have to thank us. We just kind of get to, we get to create the spirit of Christmas in a way. And, and it's, it's really more for us than it is for any kid. Mm -hmm. Um, And so I said, so now that you know that that's what I do, I get to be, I'm still going to be your Santa Claus. I'm still going to be filling that stocking because that's, I enjoy it too much to let that go. I said, but, you know, would it be okay if you were my Santa Claus? Could you be my Santa Claus for me? Could you be the dog Santa Claus? Mm-hmm. Um, and you'll see how fun this is. We'll go shopping together. Um, and and so, A, I let him choose. If he'd said, no, I don't want to do that, I would have said, you know what, that's fine. Right. <laughs> I can be my own Santa Claus, but B, I sort of, I, I tried not to talk down to him. I just tried to explain it on the most basic level without condescending to him. Um, so that he didn't feel disenchanted or lied to. Um, so, I mean, and it's the same thing with a lot of even more serious subjects Mm -hmm. that you, you, you invite them in to a conversation and sometimes that's through self-disclosure Um, but you invite them into a conversation rather than forcing them in. I agree with that. And I I also just want to highlight something that you just said, where you're talking to your child on a level where you're not speaking down to them. Your kids can understand things more than you know. And I think that they they have a lot of unique wisdom coming from a kid, that they, um, they have some interesting perspectives that we can learn a lot from them, but that we don't need to speak down to them. They understand more than we give them credit for so much of the time. So I just wanted to put a high beam on that. Yeah, it's very, very true. And you can learn from your kids. I know it seems like you have a lot to teach them, and you do, but you can learn from them. Yes, yes, I agree with that. For those people who are listening, and and there are probably many people that are in this circumstance, if you find that your conversations have suffered with your kids and you feel like maybe there's a disconnect, is there something that we can do or say that will help to bring us back to help us connect better through conversation? So, I mean, the first thing I would do is um, have dinner together and put the fo- keep the phones away. Put a bucket somewhere away from the table, um, and everyone's phone has to go in there. And uh, you don't, you just sit at the table. And you know what? If, it, if the first few nights, as in my house, the anger is so high that they don't speak at all. <laughs> mm-hmm. Okay. That's okay. That's okay. They'll get over it. You know, then I became dorky mom and started telling knock knock jokes and and um, <laughs> and it's you know I was just like look you're angry at me you're not talking to me that's fine but you're gonna hear my jokes so <laughs> <laughs> so many good ones too so many good knock knock jokes I have so many bad yes jokes. we call them bad dad jokes in my house because there's oh, oh yeah. my God, there's so many bad ones too so many yeah but I mean that was the number one most powerful thing you can do. The other thing is stop talking about uh, important things over text or email. Mm -hmm. And if they send you an important question, don't answer them. Just pick up the phone and call. Mm -hmm. Use the cell phone for what it was actually designed to do and call them on the phone. And if they can't talk to, I mean, so many kids don't even talk on the phone anymore. And even Mm -hmm. adults, research shows that we spend, adults spend nearly a half hour texting every day and only six minutes talking on the phone. I would believe that. I find it unusual that I have a couple of really close friends that I talk to every day, but uh, and and of course my my mom as well. But I I I, I gauge that as like, oh, these these are people I really care about. Then because a lot of the information comes out in text, or of course the people that I get to speak to over dinner or over playdates, where you're actually face to face. That is such a treasure for me. That that's when you know you've got some really good people in your life. 
Yeah, and and you just you know that one of the most fascinating research in recent years has been into neural coupling, neural n e u r a l, mm-hmm. and and essentially here's the basic discovery, and it's that when someone is telling a story, an you know an interesting story about themselves and their own lives, and people are listening in an, in an engaged way, their minds sink. They go into sync. Mm-hmm. So when they're looking at the fMRI, they'll see the brain waves suddenly become parallel. And if it's really a, a good connection, then um, the listener will actually anticipate changes in the in the speaker's uh, brain waves by a fraction of a second. it's It's what Gene Roddenberry would call mind meld. Mm. I mean, it's just miraculous the the ability of human beings to connect, through our voices. And that's what we hand over to emojis. Oh, gosh. That's what we give up when we decide to text instead. Mm-hmm. So if I was going to say one thing, it is use the phone. <laughs> Make them call you. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Right. And leave the, the texting for just mere facts that, yeah. uh, the, Changes um, of information. Do you want Chinese food tonight? Yes. Sure. I'll meet you in 10 minutes. That's exactly. right. <laughs> what time does practice end? 4.30. Okay. Yes. <laughs> right. I, I say to, to when I'm presenting, I'm like, if, if there's a why that needs to happen and there's some information that you need to answer regarding why is this happening, pick up the phone, talk to them face to face because... Right, and a good rule of thumb is four back and forth, right? Mm. Text, response, text, response, text, response, text, response, done, pick up the phone. (laughs) Oh, that I like. That's good. That's good. That's very concrete. Do you find that there's any, uh, any way that we can teach our kids to use these social platforms in a positive way to connect or is it all just sort of negative? in your mind. No, I mean, there's, the, I mean, look, the, the smartphone is an incredible device. And the thing that you have to decide between, um, for your kids and for your family and for yourself is which part of this device is technology that does things better than I do. Mm-hmm. The, Cause one of the problems is we've just basically handed over everything to these devices, even the things like communication that it does not do better than we do mm-hmm. naturally. So you have to choose what it does do and doesn't do which in which ways is it actually better in your life and in which ways is it uh, making your life worse your quality of life worse for example if you use facebook in a really limited way and you use it just to connect with friends that you wouldn't otherwise see or speak to that ends up being a positive impact on your life but for the vast majority of people facebook makes you miserable and i mean that scientifically <laughs> so you, you, number one the first thing is that you got to keep limits on things the other thing is is i would say turn off notica- notifications from anything that's not an actual person so like a text That's a real person communicating an email. That's a real person, obviously a phone call, but having an app send you notifications and constantly distracting your life. That's a terrible idea. And you don't need to know every time someone likes your post on Facebook or, (laughs) or retweets you, you don't need to know. So turn that stuff off. Agreed. Agreed. So if there was one thing that you could tell everybody to do, I know one of them was put down the phone, but or use the phone, <laughs> but yeah, it's one tip that you would say positively influences communication between people. What would you say? Um, one thing that positively influences communication, um, other than put down the phone, I, I would say, um, if you haven't learned something from the conversation you just had, you failed. Oh no. <laughs> So go into every single conversation saying to yourself, okay, I'm going to learn something from this. And then when you're done, think to yourself, what did I learn? And get into the habit of figuring out what you learned. Because here's the thing. Every single person, I don't care if you think they're dumb. I don't care if they're from the other political party and you disagree with almost everything they stand for. They're an expert in something. There's stuff they know that you don't know. Um, so go into every conversation with the intent, even when you need to lecture someone, even if you need to educate someone still go in with the intent that you're going to learn something from that other person 
and and your conversations will improve almost immediately. Right, and even with kids, we have to underscore yep. that. Even with kids, there's something to learn. Well, tell me, what's the resource of the week? How can we find out more about you and your fabulous new book? Anything that you're doing to promote your book, we'd love to know more about. So where do we go? I would say probably just my website, CelesteHeadley.com, or also my public fa- my public figure Facebook page. has um, That's where they keep all the events, like upcoming book talks and all that kind of stuff. And it's where I reblog all the blogs I do. So either one of those things and are just fine. Okay, great. And I know that you have a page on your website, CelesteHeadley.com, which is devoted to your book. Isn't that correct? Yep, that okay. is correct. Okay, so we'll definitely go there. This has been so enjoyable. I just, I really love speaking with you, but of course that makes sense because you're a conversation <laughs> expert. So you should be really enjoyable to speak to, but I just wanted to thank you for coming on the show and then for giving us these insights. I I love so many of the things that you said. I love the, you know, four and four for the for the tips on the texting. I, I, I love that you need to make sure you're learning something every time you sit down to talk to somebody, especially with kids, because we I don't think we often go through, uh, go to a conversation that way and that we need to either put down the phone or use the phone instead of just texting. I love all of those things. So thank you so much. You are so welcome. And one last thing I would say is that your kids can sometimes be your best help with the learning thing. Cause my son knows that I have, I, I hold myself to learning stuff. So we'll get to the end of a conversation. I say, I can't stop talking to you. I didn't learn anything. And oh. so he'll offer something up. So just <laughs> FYI, they can help you out. Yes. I think that they could. And I think kids will probably really like that, that their parents and their teachers, mentors and coaches want to learn something from them. I think that is a way to certainly make your kids feel more visible and make them know that they have a lot to offer. So I think that's wonderful. Yeah. Well, it's been a real pleasure. It's been a pleasure for me too. As I told you, I was really anticipating this and I was so excited about it. I've got my takeaways, everybody. Sweet friends, I know you have yours. Let's discuss them. Come up on Facebook. Go to facebook.com slash Dr. Robin Silverman. Don't forget to go to Celeste Headley's page on Facebook, too. We can chat about it at drrobinsilverman.com or twitter.com slash Dr. Robin. And we have a Facebook group on how to talk to kids about anything. Go there. We'll talk about it there. If you have any specific questions, we can talk about that. And we can just hear what is it that you got from this podcast. And if you love this podcast like I did, and who wouldn't? Because we have Celeste Headley on this podcast right now. So awesome. (laughs) So if you loved it like I did, could you go up to iTunes, rate, review, share it so other people can get these great strategies? These are some interesting strategies, strategies I don't think that everybody's using. I'd really appreciate it if you share it rate and review it people have got to get this that's all the time we have for today thank you so much for tuning in to how to talk to kids about anything for more information on books articles speaking engagements or curriculum please visit drrobinsilverman.com i look forward to weathering the storms and enjoying the sunny side of life together and please remember even when nothing seems to be going right we all have those days you've got this you're here you're getting the information you need And on the days when we fall short, never forget there's always tomorrow. Parenting is the ultimate do-over. And as there are moments when we doubt our know-how, our choices, and our sweet sanity, please know you're ten times the parent you think you are. You really are. Until next time, this is Dr. Robin Silverman with How to Talk to Kids About Anything. Please tune in again and keep connecting through conversation. See you next week. You've been listening to How to Talk to Kids About Anything with Dr. Robin Silverman. For more information on books, articles, speaking engagements, or curriculum, please visit drrobinsilverman.com.